Hi, my name is Matt Walter. I'm a professor at the Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago. So TTIC, or TTI Chicago, Toyota Technological Institute Chicago, it's a bit of a mouthful, is a philanthropically endowed graduate level computer science institute located on the south side of Chicago. So we're actually on the University of Chicago's campus. We were started about, you know, going on 17 years ago, so we're very young, with an endowment about $250 million from uh, a school by the same name in Nagoya, Japan, which was endowed by the Toyota Motor Corporation. We have 11 tenure track professors and 12 research assistant professors, which is this three year, excellent three year endowed position that allows people to do you know, fundamental research, build up their, their CV, and many go on to successful faculty careers or careers in industry. As a computer science institute, we are very small, or sorry, we are very focused. Um, and in particular, we're focused on machine learning, machine learning theory, and applications of machine learning. So those include computer vision, robotics, speech, NLP, computational biology. In addition to those areas, we have a strong focus on computer science theory. So myself, I'm a roboticist, and I direct the robotic intelligence through perception or laboratory or Ripple. Uh, typically, I show you pictures from the lab. Um, unfortunately, we're not allowed to go to our building, so I'm showing you just a screenshot of our webpage showing some of our students. So we have eight PhD students that are either solely advised by me or co-advised by other faculty at TTI or faculty at the University of Chicago. We have you know, a number of undergrad students. You know, I'm showing three, but there are more than three. And of course, we're roboticists, so we have lots of robots. We have wheeled robots, um, manipulators, mobile manipulators, we have drones, small and large, and we have these small quote-unquote cars. Uh, these are ducky bots. If you're familiar with Ducky Town, we have you know, 20 or so of these. Our research, again, as a robotic perception lab, is focused on the area of perception, but broadly interpreted. So we do a lot of work on natural language understanding, which is going to be the focus of this talk. Um, we work on other, uh, we look on more traditional perception methods, so computer vision, LIDAR processing. Uh, a number of my students and myself are interested in reinforcement learning, both in terms of theoretical aspects of RL as well as applications of RL, again, primarily in the context of robotics. Uh, and I have a student that I'm working with with a faculty member at the University of Chicago who's interested in neural memory architectures. So really, with you know, perhaps relevant to robotics, but more generally um, useful for a number of machine learning tasks. And I, I encourage you to visit our website for more information. It's ripple.tic.edu. Okay, so this is a video I, I typically show for people who are maybe have less experience or are less familiar with robotics, talking really what what the state of the art in robotics was until not that long ago. So I'm going to show this video from 1959. It's of a pretty famous robot called Unimate. And the, you know, it's, it's fun if for no, nothing else other than the, the background music. But it's, I think it's important to listen to what the announcer, how the announcer describes the capabilities of the robot and why it's useful. So, so I'll just pause that. So first, you know, it can perform these tasks over and over again without getting tired. It can be easily programmed by stepping it through the process that's known and still employed today as uh, kinesthetic teaching, where you grab the arm and you'll teach it through the procedure. And you can do this over and over again very accurately. So very accurate, maybe not by today's standards. Completely unaffected by heat, cold, fumes, or dust, it could take over a lot of unpleasant jobs. It can operate unattended for five. So again, doing things that are dangerous, difficult, or dull, and that's really been the you know the driving motivation for robotics for you know much of the last sixty plus years. And again, that's not terribly different from what you see today. So I'm showing a video from a Tesla Model S factory show, showing these robots assembling cars. This is clearly sped up. And you see these robots doing these very repetitive tasks that are maybe dangerous, they may be difficult. Again, these 
these parts are very heavy. A human could not do that, at least not on their own. And of course, these tasks are dull. And so here, really what's been driving, again, research and work in, in applications of robotics over the last 50 years is doing these tasks that are repetitive, dull, or dangerous, and that require high levels of accuracy. So the focus has been on achieving this level of accuracy and repeatability. So we can, you know, again, assemble cars with you know, this, the precision that's necessary to, say, build a Tesla Model S. And again, this is clearly what's used today. My work uh, has been, over the course of, you know, as a student and a researcher, is trying to build up robots that it can mitigate uncertainty. So taking robots out of the factory floor, or out of the laboratory setting, and then moving them to unstructured or semi-structured environments. And really that meet, requires methods that mitigate uncertainty. So again, this is doing tasks that are, again, dangerous, difficult, or dull, but in environments that we don't have the luxury of pre preparing a priori. And so this is, these are robots that are really operating our, as our surrogates, going places that you know, we may we, we not physically be able to go or may be too dangerous. So I'm showing in, up in the upper right what you know, is a bit of a Frankenstein of a car. This is a car that I worked on when I was at MIT for the DARPA Urban Challenge. So this is the, you know, 2007 or so. Um, uh, uh, so this is our car Talos driving this course in, in Victorville, um, California. Um, in the bottom, I'm showing a 3D rendering of the RMS Titanic that was built with this ROV, remotely operated vehicle, Her Hercules, using cameras acquired from the vehicle. So this is, again, a vehicle that's operating, in, in this case, tethered from a ship. Again, operating really as our surrogate. And this is an environment where clearly GPS does not work. And yet, if we're going to build up a map of the Titanic, we need accurate positioning of the vehicle. So how do we mitigate that uncertainty? And that's... Um, was the focus of this work, and there are some references to the papers, and they're all on the website if you're curious. We see this in a number of other applications. So disaster response, we've done a lot of work in military logistics, and you'll see some references to that during the talk. Um, what I'm particularly interested in is not just robots that can ap operate as our surrogates in unstructured environments, but really robots that can operate as our partners with and alongside people who are not roboticists as they carry out daily tasks, whether this is in in, in uh, manufacturing or logistics, as we see in the, in, the, in the upper left, so this is a Baxter robot. We have a Baxter in our lab. Many of you may be familiar with that. Here is that robot that I alluded to before that we use for logistic operations. So this is a robotic forklift that we built as part of the Agile Robotics for Logistics project. And again, it was a, it was a forklift that was designed to join humans um, in human-occupied environments that were semi-structured. So the idea was you may have an outdoor warehouse used in disaster relief that set up for a relatively short period of time. So you don't have the luxury that, say, Amazon has with their warehouses where you can put RFID codes or bar, uh, tags or barcodes on the floor and prepare the environment. This was, a, again, a, a semi-structured environment where there are people driving around in trucks, people walking around, and we wanted this vehicle to not only be safe, of course, that's the, the highest priority, but also be useful so that people who are not roboticists, you know, a 20-year-old soldier in this case, could command this vehicle to manipulate in, uh, uh, cargo. I'm particularly interested in settings, uh, in, in, in um, assistive technology settings. So working with people that are either mobility, that may be mobility impaired. So on the right is a, a voice commandable wheelchair that we developed that allows you to navigate and manipulate things simply by talking to the wheelchair, much as you would someone who is pushing the chair around, again, using natural language or applications in mobile manipul or manipulation. So for example, this user of this Jayco arm can command it to pour water into a cup, um, providing a level in of independence that they wouldn't have otherwise. Okay. And so if you look at really what the state of the art now is in terms of robots working with and alongside people, really re what we have now is people adapting to robots to accommodate the fairly primitive capabilities that robots have. So what I'm showing on the left is a video from a underwater vehicle, um, Nui, near it under the ice. This was collected in November off of, off of Greece, um, exploring an underwater volcano. This is off of the island Santorini. And so this is an arm that's being controlled by an operator on a ship via a fiber optic tether. And the operator is controlling the low level joints of the arm. So controlling each joint independently to, in this case, take a sample off of this hydrothermal vent that you, that you see there. Th this operation took roughly about 10 minutes for the person to command this arm to carry this out. 
What I'm showing on the right is a rendering, 3D rendering of Atlas. This is part of the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And this is the team from MIT commanding Atlas to, in this case, turn a valve. And you can see in the image that we have two operators, at least two operators, staring at eight screens while at least two other people stand by and watch. Again, this is a very painstaking procedure, but this is what people are doing. We're accommodating robots to perform these tasks. And really, that's not going to be scalable if we want, A, to, to take advantage of the efficiency that robots offer, but also, two, to allow people that are not, P, don't have a PhD in robotics to operate these machines to take advantage of their, these benefits. And so one way of doing that is developing robots that adapt to people rather than the other way around and enabling effective command and control mechanisms. And this is really where we need to be. And one, one example of this is using language. So developing robots that people can talk to just as if it were another person. It understands free form language. So again, maybe it's limited to the rules of grammar and, and to the task. But otherwise, you can talk to it much like you would a person and have it understand you. And this is a very challenging task uh, for roboticists, or for robots rather, because typically, or largely because the way that the robot, robots model their state and action space is very different from how humans model their state and action space. So there's this bis big disconnect that we need to bridge. And really what I'm going to talk about today is how we do that. So this is not a new area. There's been a lot of work in language understanding for robots or you know autonomous art or artificial agents, you know, dating back to the seminal work by Terry Winograd in the early 70s. Um, a lot of the earlier work in this was knowledge-based, which involved basically executing a set of rules to map lang constrained language to some formal logic specification of the state and action space. So these methods were able to exploit the structure of language, but they were fairly limited in, in, this, in the size of their action space and the richness and diversity of language, and typically involved little to no learning. Most of it was, again, executing a, a set of rules. With, with you know, the advent of statistical methods, there is a lot of work in what's referred to as statistical symbol grounding or statistical grounded language acquisition. And there are generally two approaches to this. So one formulates language understanding as a semantic parsing problem where the task is to parse language into some formal action specification. And there's, again, a lot of work uh, in this area done by Cynthia Matusik and others. Uh, another approach is treating this as a, as a language grounding problem, again, getting back to this notion of language understanding as a symbol grounding problem, where you want to map language, free-form language, to physical reference in the world. So these are objects, places, paths, and events, and then the robot's action space. And the the key advantage of these methods is that they make, exp you know, they baked in is, you know, learning plays a fundamental role. It's a first class citizen. So we can learn these parsers or we can learn these, these grounding models that allows these methods to generalize to a diverse set of, of linguistic instructions. And what I'm showing in the upper right is a factor graph representation. You'll see versions of this throughout the talk where we're now grounding language on the, on the bottom. So these are the, the, the instruction, put the tire pallet on the truck, to the set of objects and that the robot is aware of, the, the set of actions that the, are in the, age, in the robot's repertoire. And we're modeling this probabilistically, which has a number of advantages that will hopefully become clear. Okay. So what does it mean? How do we treat language understanding as a probabilistic inference task? And so what we do is we, we formulate a model. And we're going to perform inference over this model, and I'll describe what we're seeing here. So, of course, we have the input, the command. Typically, that's a string of words, so we have text coming in. It may, may be speech, and we apply a speech recognizer. And we want to then learn, a, maintain a distribution over the, the corresponding, the objects that correspond to this command, any action or any locations that the user may be referencing, any spatial relations, and any actions in the, in the robot's repertoire. And typically, we'll formulate this as, in, as a, um, a map inference, a maximum a posteriori inference, where we want to infer the set of objects, relations, actions, and locations that maximize this distribution. And key on the right-hand side is that we assume, most of these methods assume that the world model is known. So I have some representation of the robot's model of its state and action space. This could be, and we'll see examples of this, a map, an environment map. So we have a map of the environment with locations that are labeled, uh, not only by their metric position, but also their type and many their colloquial name, Matt's office, et cetera, that we can then ground to. So we assume that the world is known. 
and the key again with these methods is that we learn this distribution, the probability over symbols given world model and language, and do this in an efficient manner. Okay, so what's an example of a known world model? Um, so again, I would say most state-of-the-art methods now assume that this world model is known and they largely ignore perception. So they assume that the robot is given a database of all the possible locations that the user may refer to, all the possible actions that the robot can perform, also all the possible objects in the environment, etc. And so if you think of a spatial navigation task, say for a robotic wheelchair that someone would like to be able to command to navigate, this might look like a map, and this is a bit, might be a little bit difficult to, to read here, but this is a bird's eye view of a multi-building part of campus where these pie charts are indicating the semantic type of different location. So again, capturing, and we'll see how we do this in a bit, capturing ambiguity in the robot's model of its state space. So what we're showing here are, you know, this area here I'm pretty confident is an office. This area over here is, you know, maybe a lab and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And now we get these locations that the user may be able to refer to. And I'll talk about how we actually learn these in a bit. And this is a video of this. So what we've been focusing on is learning these models. And so this is Asachi, one of the collaborators on this project, um, who is giving a tour to, the, to this robot wheelchair. And you can see a rendering of the wheelchair in the upper right following Sachi. So it automatically follows him as he walks around the environment and he describes things to the robot. So he's conveying this semantic map of the environment to the robot using language. So it's this idea of essentially language as a, as a sensing modality. Sachi describes things and he might say, say, you know, we are in, you know, we are outside room 144 or we are in the elevator lobby. That's fairly easy to interpret. But the great thing about language is not only can you assign semantic and metric and topologic information to your current location, but you can refer to things that are outside the robot's field of view at various scales. And things that the robot may be, it may be difficult for the robot to perceive even if it was in the, in the field of view. So say colloquial names, we can easily convey via language. So it's very expressive, um, you know, things we can't do with traditional sensing modalities. Okay. So what do you do now if the robot, say the wheelchair in this case, is deployed in an environment for which it doesn't have a map? The user might be familiar with this environment, but the robot isn't. We like the, you know, and then the user gives the robot a command, say for example, go to the kitchen down the hallway. But the robot doesn't have a map that says where the kitchen locations are or where the hallways are. All the robot has is a camera, one or more cameras, and it would like, we'd like it to be able to interpret this command in the context of what it sees and decide what the correct or what, what the best action to take is. You know, perhaps to explore the environment, to try to find the hallway, um, and then, you know, to carry out this task. So the question is, how do we do this? So this is a video of this in, in action. This is a video of, of me sitting on the wheelchair, and I'm commanding this robot to, you know, similar example, go past the kitchen down the hall and take a right. Again, this is an environment where the robot knows, for which the robot knows nothing. All it has is, you know, cameras facing forward and rearward, and it has to interpret this command in the context of what it sees, and try to understand it. So this is showing, and this will become clearer hopefully. But a basically, what the robot does is that we have algorithms that hypothesize the structure of the environment. They basically hypothesize different world models. And then now it interprets the command in the context of these hypothesized world models and figures out how to act. So the, in this case, the robot saw a hallway, saw a couple of hallways, picked one, you know, perhaps arbitrarily, navigated down the hallway, saw a kitchen, and then found another hallway and took a right. We'll talk about how we do this. So again, our approach to dealing with this is really to, is to treat language as another sensing modality, just like a laser rangefinder is used on a robot to say detect obstacles or to do localization or mapping, just like a camera might be used to detect objects or to do scene classification. Language is just another sensing modality. Um, and what it provides are explicit things like the command to do, go down, go to the kitchen, but what all, what, what we're, what by exploiting it as a sensor, what we're recognizing is in the instruction are these implicit, is this, inf is this implicit information, in this case, a description of the world. And so what we developed is this method that allows us to take a command and extract, isolate both explicit information in terms of the task to be performed, 
but also implicit information, such as, again, a description of the environment that the robot can use to hypothesize a world that will allow it to navigate. And we formulate this again as an inference procedure where we do, we jointly perform inference both over the map, this world model, and the behavior or the actions that the robot's supposed to perform. So with a slight change in notation, we're going to perform inference where we have x1, t plus 1 through capital T is the future robot's trajectory up to some horizon. And then what we have as input, of course, is language. So again, this might be language might be given as the robot navigates. So hence the superscript T means the instructions that we've heard up to that point in time T. We have the robot's traditional sensor stream. This might be camera images and maybe laser, laser scans. And then we have odometry. So say from wheel encoders and IMU. And our idea is, to, our goal is to infer the robot's trajectory that, maxim, that, is, that maximizes this likelihood given the instruction that the robots had, what it's observed up to that current point in time, and then you know, its, its motion. So one way we can formulate this is, again, recognizing the fact that there is this world model that has typically been assumed before by other methods that is not known. So it's this latent variable we're going to call S, T, and we introduce it, as a, again, as a latent variable. And so on the left, we have the, the standard model that we saw before, again, before we had gamma over here. But again, inference over the set of symbols, given language, given the sensor stream up to that point in time, and then given the current model of the environment. Again, that's not known, so we also maintain a distribution over that world, given the sequence of instructions, and then the sequence of observations up to that point in time. And we marginalize over ST nominally. And we'll talk about how we can do this in a tractable manner. Okay, and so what we're going to do, as I mentioned, is we're also not perf only performing inference over uh, over the world model, but also behaviors. So rather than directly perform inference over the trajectories, we're going to say that I can represent these trajectories as this abstract set of behaviors or these action primitive, or sorry, these, these uh, meta actions, if you will, that the robot can perform. And now what we want to do is perform inference both over these behaviors, and these behaviors will then induce a trajectory, and we'll talk about how that's done, and then of course over the map, as I alluded to. And here are some in the, in the lower right, some references to the papers where this work appeared. So this is, you know, by today's standards, uh, you know, dated. Um, so we formulate this as three tasks. So one is map learning. The second is behavior learning. So again, learning the set of behaviors that the user is, is suggesting the robot perform. And then the way that we take these behaviors and our distribution over the world and figure out what is the right trajectory to execute. So what, what's the right policy to carry out, given that we believe the user is commanding the robot to perform this set of behaviors, or we have a distribution over these behaviors, and we have a distribution over world models. What's the right actions to execute? You can imagine if the robot is uncertain whether the, whether the user is referring to the hallway on the left or the hallway on the right, what the robot might do is it might pick, you know, pick one, say, navigate down, and as it, as it navigates, it's, it sees that there's not a kitchen, say, for example, and the distribution over worlds changes. And so on the left, we have the policy that we execute to get this exploratory behavior. So why is this difficult? So one, as with language understanding, uh, in general, you know, language is by nature very different from the sensor streams that robots typically use and the models that we typically have to capture uncertainty in these traditional sensor streams like, you know, camera images or laser scans. Um, so it's, it's not only very different, but language is very noisy. It's, in a sense, very am ambiguous. If I say, you know, down the hall, for example, is the kitchen. How far down the hall? Which hallway am I referring to? And the challenge is, is capturing this uncertainty with models we, where we, the models we typically reason over may not be well suited to modeling this uncertainty. Um, the policy that we're executing is not now given a world model or a singular behavior, but rather a distribution over world models and a distribution over behaviors. And so now we need to be able to learn what's the right policy to execute when we are uncertain about both the behaviors and these symbols. And the space of these possible observations and behaviors is, is quite large, even for spatially compact environments. Okay, so we, we're going to view this as this block diagram, again, breaking up these three pieces where we have you know, map inference, as I mentioned before, inferring the set of behaviors and this policy, pl this policy plan. And we'll assume that we have as input, of course, language, as I mentioned before, and traditional sensor streams, images, uh, LIDAR, and 
odometry. And this is just showing the information flow, and I'll describe this in more detail. Okay. So let's again return to our distribution over marginalized distribution over behaviors and semantic maps, and just look at each piece of this separately. Okay. So we have the first is map uh, is taking uh, language and using it and other sensors data to infer a distribution over worlds. And so when we do this, what we're going to what we're going to assume is that we get, we're given a natural language instruction. As I said, in that instruction is implicit information of the environment. We're going to call that implicit information annotations. And so what we're going to do is we're effect, effectively going to ground natural language into a set of annotations to these this implicit information about the world. And then so we're going to formulate map inference as inferring the, the semantic map. Again, this might be like that pie chart that I showed before, given this set of annotations, this implicit information in the command, and then the robot's traditional sensor data. Okay, so these annotations might be, say, for example, that there exists a region of type hallway in the environment, there exists at least one or at least one kitchen, and there is one pair of kitchen and hallway such that the kit that they exhibit this relationship where the hallway kitchen is down the hallway. So a set of relations, again, it's just a simple example. Okay, so the question now is where do we get these annotations? We, tr we treat this as a symbol grounding problem, and we use a model known as the hierarchical distributed correspondence graph, which is a, again, essentially a conditional random field model where that exploits the hierarchical nature of language and, and from that, some conditional independencies that we can exploit to perform language grounding in an efficient manner. And as it, this, the code for, for this is available on GitHub. If you go to ripple.ttsc.edu and go to the code section there, there's a link to the code for HDCG and its many variants. Um, it's also published in this IROS paper from 2015. And so again, annotations for us are a set of regions, a set of objects, and a set of spatial relations. And we're going to view this as the space of groundings. If you recall from you know, several slides back, we, we talked about groundings as being a set of objects, locations, actions, and spatial relations. In this case, the, the symbols that we're grounding to is a space of regions that may exist that the user is referring to, the space of objects that may exist, and a set of spatial relations between these regions, between, between regions and, between re and objects and between regions and objects. So our goal now is, again, treating this as a symbol grounding problem, is to, given language and perhaps the current map, our goal is to, and it, for simplicity, and the details are in the paper, we're going to treat, we're going to introduce this binary correspondence variable. So we don't have to have a generative model over language or a generative model over the space of symbols. What DCG, distributed correspondence graph, and hierarchical distributed correspondence graph does is introduce this binary correspondence. So again, this is a, a binary variable that is one if a particular grounding corresponds to a phrase and zero otherwise. And if you, if you, see, if you go to the paper, you can see that this makes inference far more tractable and allows us to exploit some of these by, by exploiting some conditional independence relationships. And so we have this graphical model. I admit it's, it's a bit, you know, a bit of, a, of a beast here in terms of parsing it. It's, you know, may not, uh, it may be difficult to to read, but this is again a conditional random field model represented as a factor graph, where like the one we saw earlier, we have on the bottom are these observed random variables, which are the which are the which are the words, go to the kitchen down the hallway. And then we have these latent random variables, gammas here, which are the particular symbols, in this case the annotations, that may be implicit in this command. And then we see these fees are these correspondence variables. And so what we want to do for inference, so Vertically here, we have all possible symbols that hallway might go correspond to, and we want to infer the set of symbols, the set of correspondence variables that are true, and then that will give us if if a particular phi is true, that means that hallway refers to this particular symbol, which might be again there exists a region of type corridor, say for example. And I'll gloss over the details, but basically the hierarchical distributed correspondence graph allows us to. Uh, uh, essentially, condense, reduce the space of symbols that we're performing inference over in a you know somewhat intel intelligent manner to again further improve inference. And the, the details are all in, in the IROS paper. Okay, so what that gives us again, we perform inference over this, and we we get a distribution over symbols, saying that implicit in this, in this command is the ind indication that in this environment there is at least one 
region of type hallway, at least one region of type kitchen. And for one or more of those kitchen and hallways, they exhibit the spatial relationship where the kitchen is down the hallway. Okay, so that gives us a set of the, the setup annotations that was alpha. Okay, so now how do we actually represent the map? And we represent the map as what we recall, we refer to as a semantic graph. So this S is the map. It's this tuple where we have underlying this tuple is a topology. If you're familiar with SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, you may be familiar with pose graph formulations to SLAM. This is very much like a pose graph formulation, but we have some topological structure of the environment, representation of the environment, where a node corresponds to, say, regions, locations, or objects. And the existence of an edge between two different regions or objects indicates some constraint, some spatial constraint between those two regions. Again, perhaps that the kitchen is, one might be a kitchen, one might be a hallway, and it might, this might capture the fact that the kitchen is down from the hallway. Each one of these nodes has a location, this metric embedding. So in 2D, it's their X, Y, maybe their orientation. And then each one of these also has a label. This is its semantic class, say, for example. And I'm visualizing this as a multinomial over the class. And this is our representation. We refer to this as a semantic graph. And we want to maintain this distribution as the robot navigates. So as we get more and more sensor information and perhaps more annotations, as the user may issue more commands or more descriptions, we want to maintain this distribution. And the, the challenge with this is that the space of topologies is combinatorially large. So tractable inference requires some approximation. So we use what's referred to as a Rao Blackwellized particle filter um, to perform inference. It's been used for other SLAM tasks and other uh, so simultaneous localization and mapping and other, semant and other, and other uh, um, semantic mapping tasks as well. Uh, we have a couple papers on that. Um, so again, we have our tuple here where we have S on the left and we have our observations on the right. And again, as I mentioned before, we have this topology where there's a node for each location or object. Edges denote some spatial constraint between these nodes, these regions or objects. Each one of these no nodes has a pose. And we have this semantic label um, for nodes. It might be a colloquial name for these nodes, Matt's office, say, for example, and it's type, type office. And then we want to infer this as the robot gets more and more sensor data. As the robot moves, we get more odometric data. And of course, as we get more language coming in. Again, that would more generally be annotations. So we factor this distribution. There are no assumptions here. There's just an exact factorization. And I'll talk about how we maintain this, to this distribution over the semantic graph. So on the right, we have this distribution over topologies. And as I mentioned before, the space of topologies is combinatorially large. So the way that we deal with that is by first recognizing the fact that while the space of topologies is large, if you, if you can think about the distribution over possible topologies for an environment, the likelihood tends to be focused in a, in a few locations. There are many topologies that really aren't reasonable for most spaces, just again by the nature of the way that most spaces are divided up spatially with, with walls, etc. So we take this distribution and we represent, maintain it using a sample-based representation, a particle filter if you're familiar with particles. And so what I'm visualizing here on the bottom is a 1D one-dimensional view of the topology where each circle is a node. These edges denote some spatial constraint. And what the vertical bars here are some likelihood. So I'm, what I'm representing is a basically, you can think of this basically as a set of n hypotheses over the topology of the environment. And then each one, each, each hypothesis is associated with some weight, how likely that hypothesis is. And we're going to maintain this sample-based representation. Each of these sample-based representations, if we model the edges, so again, edges are spatial constraints, and these are going to be inherently uncertain. So if we model these spatial constraints as being Gaussian distributed, what this allows us to do is this allows us to represent this using, again, the joint distribution. So each topology, each hypothesized topology, now shown in, in a 2D version here, corresponds to hypothesized edges between nodes. And associated with these edges are, um, again, these Gaussian distributions. And so we, you can show that you can, and this actually gets back to some of my thesis work from way back when now. Um, you, if you represent this Gaussian distribution, so as a joint di distribution over, in this case, five random variables, continuous random variables. If you represent this Gaussian not in the standard 
uh, covariance form, where you have a covariance matrix and a mean vector, which many of you may be, are probably familiar with. But instead, you represent in the dual what's referred to the canonical or information form, where you're maintaining the information matrix and information vector. So information matrix is just, is again, the Fisher information matrix. It's the inverse of the covariance matrix, and you have this information vector. What that allows us to do is now look at the information matrix. And the information matrix, unlike the covariance matrix, is, in this case, is sparse. Uh, it may not look like it from this picture, but if you look at most actual uh, distributions over topologies, or over, over graphs, it's, it's sparse. And because it's sparse, we, that, but by virtue of the sparsity, we can perform inference in a tractable manner. We can be smart about how we perform. We, we can perform inference by exploiting the sparsity. And again, you can see the papers as well as my, my thesis if you're, you know, can't fall asleep and you want something to read. And lastly, we have this distribution over labels. Again, the semantic class for each one of these nodes in the environment. And we model this as a Dirichlet distribution. Okay, so we'll see some examples of what this distribution looks like. So what I'm showing here is a 3D rendering of our wheelchair executing that same command that was shown in the video a little while ago, namely navigate down the hallway, pass the kitchen, and take a right. And so what we're visualizing here is the distribution over semantic maps, or the distribution over the world models, where we're visualizing a subset of the particles, each hypothesizing a distri different distribution over the world. Again, these are maintained via this Rao Black Lies particle filter. And at this point in time, you know, basically essentially in the beginning, the agent, the, the vehicle, the, the robot, has seen part of the environment that's in indicative of being a lab. So all of the particles essentially agree that this area is a lab. Again, um, there's some uncertainty associated with it, but again, it's classic believes that this area is the lab. Um, and what we're showing here again is the spatial extent here of where we think the lab setting is. Now, each of the different particles is hypothesizing a different location for the hallway. The hallway is yet to be seen. So different particles hypothesize different locations for the hallway, typically in front of the vehicle. And then they also hypothesize, again, relative to that, some locations for the kitchen, namely that it's consistent with being down the hallway. So some particles hypothesize that the hallway is over here and then that the kitchen is over here, down from these hallways. Others hypothesize that the hallway is in, is in front of the wheelchair and then the kitchen is then down from that at various scales, you can see here. So as the robot continues to navigate, and we'll talk about how it's actually executing, it's deciding on what to do, it's going to then make more further observations of the environment that's going to allow, us, allow it to refine this distribution. So as the robot navigates a little bit, a little bit more, it uses its, its LIDAR and has some uh, classifier on it that reads in laser scans and believes that this area here is the hallway. So pretty much all the particles agree that there, that this area is highly likely to be a hallway. Again, there's some uncertainty associated with it because our classifier is not perfect. Um, there is one, at least one particle hypothesized that there's an additional hallway over here, and then it's not shown in, the, in, the, in this display here, but that it's hypothesizing that there's a kitchen somewhere over here that's down from that hallway. Other part, and there's another particle that hypothesizes that the hallway is over here, and then the kitchen may be down here. And so we see this distribution. And so as the vehicle the robot proceeds to navigate, it's, it gets to this area. The kitchen is actually over here. It sees a refrigerator and a microwave. So it, it recognizes that it, that area is indeed the kitchen. So the particles agree, agree that the, this area is highly likely to be the kitchen. But again, it maintains the hypothesis that the hallway that the user was, was referring to was over here and that the kitchen might be in this location. And this continues as the vehicle navigates. Okay. And so now, given this distribution over environments, the question is now, how do we infer the set of behaviors? This, again, we want to go, rather than from trajectories, we want to go to some abstract representation of the actions that the robot can perform. And this is done in the context of this distribution over worlds. And so that what we do is we formulate, again, this as a grounding problem, where we formulate the set of behaviors as a set of actions that the robot can perform. In this case, you know, the robot, it's a wheeled robot, it navigates. So it can navigate to a location. If this were a mobile manipulator, it might be to grab some particular object. And so we also, the grounding space also includes regions, locations where the agent can navigate to. Um, objectives, we may want to do this quickly. Other settings, we may want to do this clandestinely. And then some relations between these. We get, as in the context of inferring uh, annotations, we formulate this as a grounding problem. We use the hierarchical distributed correspondence graph. So this is a factor graph representation where the observed random variables are on, are on the bottom. 
these are the words in the instruction. And then each the latent random variables are the particular symbol that this is grounding to. And we formulate this again as an inference task to represent, to recognize the set of behaviors. So given that, now we have a distribution over world. We've described how we come up with that. And then we have this distribution over policies. There, should, there is actually a behavior that's not being shown here, distribution over latent behaviors. And we want to do is find what is the right sequence of actions or what's the right trajectory that the robot can take that is optimal given this inferred distribution over behaviors and inferred distribution over worlds. And we formulate this as a decision theory problem where the task is to take as input the current pose of the robot, the distribution over worlds, and there's again also distribution over behaviors, and choose what it believes to be the optimal action. And the way we formulate this task is as one of minimizing some cost. So there's some cost that's a function of the agent's position, the action that can be formed, the distribution over worlds, and we want to find the policy that minimizes this cost. So the question is, <clears throat> how do we formulate this cost? So we, we take, we, we have, what in this case, what is a, a set of hand-engineered features um, that try to capture the relevance of certain aspects of it, certain trajectories. Um, so the path that the robot might take, um, relationships between the path and the geometry of the environment. So namely, if you're going down the hallway, you may want to go along the long section of the hallway. So reasoning over things like geometry of the path, geometry of landmarks, and the relative geometry. Now, of course, these features are not known because we don't have knowledge of the environment. We don't know the exact landmark geometry or where the landmarks are. So instead, what we do is we look at the first k moments, and we use what's referred to what's known as the reproducing kernel Hilbert space embedding. So it's an embedding where we look at the first k moments. Essentially, it's looking at the again the expectation of the first k moments of of these features given the distribution over maps. And again, because we're modeling this distribution as using a particle filter, it's again, it's a set of n hypotheses. Each has their corresponding likelihood or their weight. So we can compute the expectation by taking this weighted sum over, over these, uh, looking at the weights according to the particle filter. Okay, so now we formulate the cost as using these RKHS embeddings, this weighted combination of these features. So this this linear, this, this model that's a weighted weighted sum of these of these features. Now the question is, now where do we get these weights? Um, so because again, the policy amounts. The policy is the problem of minimizing this cost function, but we need to come up with a cost function. So we formulate this as an imitation learning problem, where we ask people to navigate in an environment that they're not familiar with. We follow them with a, with a robot. So we we record their trajectory, their their actions. And what we want to do now is we assume that they are optimizing some cost function that by assumption is, is, can be described as this weighted combination, weighted sum of these, of these features, linear sum of these features. And what we want to do is we want to find the weights such that the actions executed by these demonstrators is optimal or near optimal. And this, again, amounts to just a regular, standard regularized multi-class hinge loss optimization problem where we're penalizing disagreements between actions that minimize this cost and those of the, these expert demonstrations, these human demonstrations. And then the actual loss that we, that we optimize over, again, is this multi-class hinge loss with some regularization penalty on, on the weights for these features. Okay, we experimentally evaluated this on two different physical robots, so these clear path huskies shown on the left, these skid steer vehicles, and again, the, the voice command of a wheelchair that you've seen several times. And we consider three variants. So one is the gold standard, where we know the map of the environment. And now this is just amounts to this symbol grounding problem that I alluded to before. So given an instruction, where is the location and, uh, that the user is referring to? And we can essentially just go there once we infer that. The second variant that we consider is, again, the environment is not known. And what we'll do is, rather than use language as a sensor, the algorithm is going to do its best to interpret the instruction in the context of what it's seen up to that point in time. So given nothing, it's going to interpret the instruction in the context of the image and the laser scanner that it sees. And then it's going to navigate. It's going to collect a new image, new laser scan data. And then it's going to use that to build up a map of the environment and then infer ground the instruction in the context of what it sees. But importantly, it's not using language as another sensing modality. The third variant is our algorithm, where we're using language 
to infer implicit information about the environment, using that implicit information to hypothesize a distribution over maps, and learning a policy that acts according to that distribution. So we evaluate this in simulation where we're looking at the distance traveled. This is on the left, the distance traveled by the agent, so lower is better. And not surprisingly, when we know the map, the agent essentially every time goes directly there. So you can't even see the error bars, but you know, mean distance, you know, 12.88 meters in this simulated environment. On the other extreme, when we're not using language as a sensor and we're relying just upon interpreting the instruction in the context of what the agent sees and essentially happening to stumble upon the destination, we find that the agent travels about twice as far as it does when the map is known. In, in our case, when we're running our algorithm using language as a sensor, we find that the robot takes paths that are slightly longer than, again, the gold standard knowing the map, not surprisingly, but not too, not, not too different. So the robot does have to do some exploration to find the goal, but by exploiting language as, again, this different additional sensing modality, we find that we can significantly reduce the, the distance traveled by the robot by essentially acting deliberately in the context of what it's able to infer from language. And we find similar phenomena, similar results when we do this with the physical robot trials, where we found in our settings, I think it's about you know, a couple dozen uh, experiments, we find that our vehicle, our, running our algorithm, the robot travels about as far as when the environment is known. I guess the mean is actually technically lower, but that's not statistically significant. Again, when we don't use language as a sensor, we find that the robot travels twice as far. Again, when it does get to the destination, it essentially happens to stumble upon it as it, again, essentially executes what's in the beginning is essentially a random walk till it gets to the destination. Okay, so we find that the method works well. There are a number of limitations with, with this approach and other approaches to language understanding for robots. And one is that they rely on extensive manual annotation and feature engineering. So typically the way we train these models is we'll record a video of a real or a simulated robot performing some task. And we'll go to Amazon Mechanical Turk, ask people to watch this video, and write out what they would have told, say, a person to do um, if it were doing what was shown in the video. And so we collect, and that's fairly easy to do, to collect these examples. People watch a video and they type out what they would have told the robot to do. And then we take these, these, this, this data set and we break it down into smaller uh, you know, phrases and actions, and we then collect examples of, say, for example, down the hall, and the trajectory of the, the corresponding trajectory of the wheelchair, in this case, going down the hall, as well as some negative examples. And we hand engineer a bunch of features that we, th might, we, we think might be relevant for associating natural language with these, with these trajectories, in this case. And then we train these models, and then we have some held out validation set where we see how well this model, uh, how well this model performs, and we typically go back and have to hand engineer, engineer, tweak our features to improve performance. And this is true not only of this method, but pretty much all existing at the time existing methods for language understanding for robotics and robots and artificial agents more generally, where they use extensive feature engineering, extensive annotation, and. Uh, um, additional linguistic resources and specialized knowledge bases. And so what we were interested in doing is seeing whether we can learn to translate, essentially map natural language uh, to robot actions in environments that are not known a priori without any prior linguistic knowledge and little to no annotation. So again, as I, as I mentioned, collecting the training data is easy. We can easily get examples of natural language utterances paired with action sequences that the robot carry out by just using Amazon Mechanical Turk. And so our hope was to be able to take just that data without any annotation and learn to perform this task, again, importantly, in an unstructured environment. So we formulate this, again, as an inference process and forgive the change in notation. So on the right, we have the sequence, uh, the instruction sequence. This is a sequence of words of length n. As the robot, so the robot's given that at the outset, it gets its current sensor data, let's say an image at time one. And then it's going to output an action. It's going to move. It's going to get another input, at another observation at time two, et cetera, on, onwards up to this horizon T. So that's a sequence of observations that the robot gets. And we want to learn a distribution over the resulting action sequence over that horizon. And we want to maximize this. So maximum a posteriori sequence of actions or sequence of trajectories, a sequence of poses. Um, so this is essentially a sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning problem, and it looks in some sense 
mimics the problem of machine translation. So if you could think about the input, of course, in this case it might be English, an English language instruction, and the output is an action sequence. You can think of the action sequence as a sort of a, as a robot language, and effectively what we want to do is we want to translate the English instruction into this action sequence. Um, now it's not quite machine trans, not not quite machine translation in that. The action sequence is, is a very different language, if you will, but also we have this additional input, which is the environment observation, so what the agent's observing as it's navigating the environment. But still, there's been a lot of work over the last you know, several years, the last handful of years, really, in the context of neural-based methods for machine translation and sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning more generally, and we want to leverage that. Um, so really to formulate, uh, to the extent we can formulate this as a machine translation problem. Now, as I mentioned, it's not really machine translation. It's, it may be helpful to think about it as if it were, but it's different. Again, in, unlike machine translation, we have this additional input, which is the images that the agent sees as it navigates. And also, unlike machine translation, there's really, you know, it's not as if we want to map each word in the, in the input sequence to a word in the output. Many of the words are not, may not be relevant in the context of generating an action, navigation action. So it's not quite machine translation. So, but again, modeling what at the time state-of-the-art methods look like in the context of sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence learning, we formulate this, our model, as, a, as an encoder, aligner, decoder architecture, where we take as input a sequence of words. This is the instruction, go forward two segments to the end of the hall. We're given that at the beginning. The agent's deployed in the environment. It has some observation from, let's say, its camera, and we want to output the current action or sequence over actions. And then what's going to happen is the agent's going to execute that action at time step t, time step t plus 1. It's going to get a new observation of the, of the environment. And then we want to output the next action or distribution over a horizon of actions. And so we can, we, to formulate this task, we use an encoder aligner decoder architecture. So we take the input instruction as a one hot representation of the instruction, and we encode it into this latent representation that captures a sentence context. Again, this is fairly standard in machine translation and other sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning problems. We use an LSTM RNN, um, bidirectional, so going both ways in the sentence, and we use that to learn a representation of um, a, represent, a representation of the input instruction. <clears throat> and then what we do, get my cursor back here, and then what we do is we're going to decode that, so we're going to take this latent representation of the input instruction, and we're going to take that as well as the input, the image that the agent is seeing, and we're going to decode that into an output sequence of actions, and that's what that is our decoder. And in the, in between, we have this aligner. That what the aligner is doing is similar to this notion of attention and vision, and what it essentially is doing is it's learning to align or associate embeddings of words in the input to actions and, and images in, uh, that are useful for, for decoding. And we'll see some examples of what that looks like. Now, unlike standard aligners, we use what we, what we, what we refer to as this multi-level aligner, where we're associating or aligning not only the embeddings of words, so this hidden latent embedding H, but also the actual words that were, that were, that were spoken. And we find that that's useful when we want to actually associate instructions with the actual images in the scene because, again, actually looking at the actual word that was spoken tends to improve performance, and we'll show that through an ablation in a bit. So again, that's our multi-level aligner. So again, we're, we're aligning based upon the hidden representation, the latent representation of the word from our LSTM RNN, but then also the word that was spoken. Then we have these attention weights here. So we evaluate this on what is one of the few uh, benchmark tasks for language understanding in the context of navigation, which is this data set that was proposed by Matt McMahon in 2006. Matt was a, a student of Ray Mooney's and Ben Kuyper's <clears throat> at University of Texas, Austin. And it involves three virtual worlds that are sort of like office-like environments. And these, envi these environments have you know, paintings on the walls, various objects dispersed throughout the environment, um, different patterns on the, on, on the floor, tile, carpet, etc. And what they did is they had a pair of people, one who was familiar with the environment, and that person generated an instruction to go from one location to another. So, so from this location to this location. They gave, then they took another, the, the second person, immersed them in this 3D simulator and had them follow this instruction. And they recorded what they saw and, then, and, and their actions as well. And what this results in is 700 
paragraph instructions paired with the images that the follower saw and then the actions that they executed. And of the, in, in total, 3,200 single sentence action and image sequences. Uh, this is a benchmark test that's used for a number of, as I mentioned, language understanding domains. And here's an example of what this looks like. Here's a paragraph for that path that's shown on the left. These instructions in include a bunch of typos, errors, people mix up their left, uh, left and right, etc. And so we take this, and there are a couple of evaluations that people uh, do on this data set. So one is looking at single sentence accuracy. So sticking the, the agent, the robot, in the environment, giving it a single sentence, and looking at how accurately it gets to the right destination, so exactly at the right destination, with the correct heading. And so this is the accuracy, so far to the, farther to the right is better. And we compare ours to a number of, at the time, state-of-the-art methods. And we found that ours, our method significantly outperforms existing methods including those that use additional annotations, additional data annotations that we don't have access to, as well as this logical form lexicon. The other baseline that people evaluate is a multi-sentence, so giving the agent this full paragraph and having it follow the instruction. As you can imagine, this is challenging because if the agent makes a mistake along the way, the, the, these mistakes compound, unless there's some explicit mechanism that allows the agent to recover, to backtrack. And so we find that while our method is not state-of-the-art, it's competitive with these with the existing methods by U of Artsy, and who's now at, at Cornell, who, who use these additional log logical form lexicon and these additional annotations. Okay. So as I, as I promised, we also do an, an ablation study to figure out what is the contribution of the different model components. And this is on a held-out validation set. So we look on the right, so look on the right, and we have our full model here with our high level this our high-level aligner. If we ablate that, if we re remove that and use a standard aligner, we lose almost two percentage points in terms of performance. Then if we take away the, the aligner, we lose a little bit, really not much. So basic aligner isn't getting us too much. And we look at our bidirectional, so encoding the input sentence forward and backward. That gets us roughly about you know, half a percentage point in terms of performance. And then if we don't do any encoding, Sorry, sorry, this is a bidirectional encoder, not a liner. That gets us about half a percentage point. And if we do no encoder, we lose about six percentage points. And we see similar behavior on multi-sentence. Now, as I mentioned, with, with the multi-sentence, there's this compounding effect where if we make a mistake early on, early on it's, it's difficult to backtrack. And we find that you know, if we look at how often we get to the right destination, we're getting there about 30% of the time, but 72% of the time we're, we're within three steps of the, of the desired location. So when we're not getting there, we are tend to get there, we tend to be close by the desired destination. Okay, here, so here's a visualization of that same map that we saw previously. And what I'm going to show you here, again, so the agent starts at this location B here. It's given this instruction and then it navigates. This is the ground truth of where the follower, the path that the follower took, and it's actually the same path that our agent learned to take. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the attention that, these, that the network is learning automatically. So I'm just going to highlight some of these. So the agent starts at this location here, and it's given the instruction, go forward one segment to the intersection with the wood floored hall. So this is the instruction here that's fed as input, and then this is the actions that the agent decides to execute. Here. Again, it's a distribution over action. So this is action at time t, and this is action at time t plus 1. And what we're visualizing here are the attention weights. And again, importantly, it, it has the word go really as a one-hot embedding, so it's just this vector with one where the word go goes to. It doesn't really know that this action here is go. It's action number 5, say, for example, and this is action number 0 is stop. So importantly, it's learning to associate, again, darker is more attention, so uh, more relevant, associate this word go forward, one, with this idea that the first action should be go, but after that it should learn to stop. And if you look here, there, this hallway here is wood floored, and so it's learning to associate wood floored with this location as to where it should stop it should stop when it, when it sees this wood floor in the image. And this is entirely learned. And we see this later on when the agent is here. We have this go forward one segment to the intersection containing the lamp. So the agent starts here, goes this way again. Go forward, it recognizes that that maps to action five. But then because it's one segment, it knows that, that, that the resulting action should be stopped. And it's associating this word, you know, the 
the area containing the lamp with this location where it should stop. This location here. And again, this is entirely learned just from these tuples of sentences, images, se sentences, image sequence, and action sequence. Okay, so we've talked about, again, the high-level motivation is enabling robots to operate effectively as our partners. And, uh, you know, I've, I've presented two different methods, one more traditional um, conditional random field-based model and then a more recent neural model for doing language understanding. But for robots, in, beyond language understanding, it's also useful if they, if they are able to generate language. And this is something that my group has been working on for, for a, a number of years. And this is important for, one, just establishing trust between the human and this robot partner. It is important for just facilitating, enabling effective human-robot collaboration. You can imagine settings where the robot is serving as a tutor. It's useful if it's able to generate language. And importantly, it should be able to generate freeform natural language. And this is an area that we've looked at. So consider the problem of navigating. So sort of flip what we were looking at before, where now a user is deployed in an environment that they're not familiar with, and they want to get to some destination. And you want, may want a robot to give them an instruction, in, instructing them on how to go from their current location to the desired destination. So what we want to do is we want to plan. And robots are very good at planning. We can do that. We can plan the path easily. But now we want to take this path, and we want to convert it to natural language allowing a person to effectively follow this path. That's the goal. Okay, so showing an example of this in this, again, 3D environment that we've evaluated on. So that's the task, to generate an instruction that allows a person to accurately navigate this to get to the destination and perhaps to get there along the correct path. Okay. So we model this as what's referred to as a selective generation problem. So uh, briefly, uh, if you imagine a path through an environment, whether it's an, you know, an office-like environment or, say, navigating the street to get to some destination, typically, again, if you use you know, Google Maps or Waze or what have you, typically, if they give you an instruction, they're typically telling you to go a certain distance and to turn at a certain intersection. But for, you can imagine, what, what, when we found, what people tend to prefer is not instructions that tell them to go forward 10 feet or 20 feet, but rather to go, you know, go down the hallway past the copy room and take a left, so using landmarks. Um, so you could think about this as if the robot, the robot has a map of the environment, it has a path that it wants the user to follow. There are a number of different ways the robot could describe this, the agent could describe this path. It could, could when necessary, choose metric distance, to use distance. Other times it could refer to reference landmarks, doors, water, drinking fountains, copy rooms, etc. And so there are a number of different ways that the agent could describe the path, a number of different things that it could talk about. And once it's decided what to talk about, there's this problem of taking that and generating a natural language instruction. So we formulate this, as I was mentioning, as this problem we refer to as selective generation, where there are two problems. There's one is content selection, which is figuring out what to talk about. What should I reference? Should it be distances or landmarks? And then surface realization. Now that I've figured out, now that the agent's figured out what it wants to talk about, how do I do that in natural language? And that's how we're formulating this. So again, we have some input. This is a cartoon, of course. That's a map. Again, using, continuing with this, the, the bird's eye view of this office-like environment where we have landmarks, paintings, etc. And we want to figure out, we have some path, and we want to figure out what should I talk about? And that's what we're deciding here. So for this path segment, should I talk about this hat rack or should I talk about, you know, stopping at the intersection with the, with the green carpet, etc., or one go forward 10 feet, etc. And I may say, it may say go forward once in this case. I may want to say face the easel and move to the lamp. So I want to convert this representation of the path and what I want to talk about to free form language. And ideally, you want to learn this from data, so from examples of how people would describe paths to the environment and their preferences. So in certain settings, they may prefer distances. In other settings, they may prefer landmarks, and we like to be able to learn that. So just briefly, that's the way we formulate this. Again, we formulated this as an inverse reinforcement learning problem where we formulate content selection, i.e. figuring out what to talk about, as, an uh, as a problem of getting a bunch of demonstrations where people issue commands. And we learn some cost or reward function that captures human preferences. And we then use that to decide what to talk about. And then we have a sequence to sequence model, much like the one we talked about previously, where it's almost flipped now, where we're going from paths and er, er, objects and locations and distances and using and taking that sequence and converting that to natural language. 
So we evaluated this again on this train and evaluated this on this sale data set by Matt McMahon, which I spoke to earlier. And one of the standard ways of evaluating generation method, language generation methods like this, you know, again, we, ideally we want some automated way of doing this. And one standard is what's referred to as the blue score, uh, sort of like an n-gram matching score. Uh, it's not at all perfect because you can imagine there are many different ways of uh, describing the same path. And the blue score is only going to be high if your description matches the, the ground truth. Uh, which is not always the case. And we find, though, in this setting, we do fairly well, again, achieving about 75, almost 75% in terms of blue. We, again, we visualize our aligner as we did before, and we find that, again, I should say that our, our, so we have, again, this is our representation of the content selection, so what we decided to talk about. And again, these are just, I'm visualizing these as words, but again, to the network, these are just, you know, numbers. This is, you know, this is, um, you know, symbol five, this is symbol six, et cetera. And then the output, this is word 10, word 20, et cetera. It doesn't, you know, these are just one hot embeddings. But it's learning to associate, um, you know, things like sofa with this, you know, the symbol that corresponds to the sofa with the word that is bench. Um, it's side right is associated with this notion of turning, et cetera. And again, this is completely learned from, from in an end-to-end -end manner. So blue is one way of evaluating it, but another question is, well, does it actually work? How well does it allow people to actually follow instructions? So we conducted a human subject experiment where we had 42 participants on Amazon Mechanical Turk, 21 female and 21 male. And we would stick them in this environment and we would randomly give them an instruction that was either generated by a human or generated by our method. And we looked at a bunch of different metrics, including how accurately did they follow the path? How accurately did they reach the destination? We asked, asked them qualitative questions at the end about how informative they found the instruction, how easy it was to follow, how confident were they that they reached the destination based upon the instruction, and also whether they thought the instructor was a, a robot or a human. And we found that when the agent was following our method, or the humans rather, were following our method, they actually reached the destination um, more often, the correct destination, than they did when they were following human instructions. Again, humans tend to make mistakes, mix, or do make mistakes rather, mixing up their left and their right. They found, they, they, they much preferred our instructions in terms of how informative they were. They found them easier to follow than the human instructions. They were more confident that they got to the destination when they were following our instructions than compared to those generated by humans, but they were able to recognize that ours were generated by a robot rather than a human. So they were correctly able to distinguish this. And we think that this is looking at it is because our synthesizer made some grammatical errors, and we think that people were queuing off of this and able to identify that, that it was a, an artificial agent. So just to conclude, again, so this is a you know, summary of some of the work that has been done in my group over the last several years, focusing on natural language understanding in unknown environments. Really the key to this work, at least the first half of it, is this idea, and we do this in much of the other work we do, is this idea of using language as another sensing modality, um, exploiting advantages that language provides that are not available in traditional sensing, uh, sensor modalities like, like vision and like LIDAR. And we describe this way of we can formulate and learn from demonstration this belief space policy that learns to follow natural language instructions in an unknown environment by one, exploiting language to learn a distribution over environments and exploiting that distribution. And I've talked about a neural architecture that allows us to get away from significant challenges of annotating data and this need to hand engineer features and allows us to learn to, again, using the analogy, translate natural language to actions that a robot can carry out and how essentially we can flip this model in the other direction and use it to generate natural language instructions that we've demonstrated in the context of navigation that yield performance comparable to those uh, human generated instructions. Um, so again this is joint work with a number of people at TTI and elsewhere so much of this work has been done with uh, a colleague of mine Tom Howard we were at MIT together and he's Tom's at University of Rochester. Uh, Felix was a, is a collaborator he was at Carnegie Mellon University, he's at EPF now, I think he's actually at a startup. Sachi, who you saw in several of the videos and images, he was a PhD student, now he's at um, uh, Google. Um, the work on the neural language-based method was done with a research faculty member at TTI, uh, Mohit Bansal, who's now assistant professor at UNC, a student of mine, Andrea Daniele, 
PhD student and a former student of mine at, at, and Mohith's at, at U Chicago and TTI, who is now a PhD student at Johns Hopkins. So links to the papers are available on our lab website, ripple.ttic.edu. Uh, there's my website. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Take care.